Good morning, Whedon. Joy to be with you guys and thankful for this privilege to come and worship Jesus uh, together to uh, my good mentor of some 15 years, Chaplain Waybright, and to Dr. Riken, leader of this great tradition here at Whedon. And most importantly to all of you guys, it's just good to be uh, with you. I bring you greetings from Indian Wells, California, Southern California, think LA, but go east 90 miles in Jesus' name. Uh, it's a literal desert, and so we questioned whether or not we were supposed to go to Wheaton. God, is it truly your will for me to come to Wheaton this week? And the day we flew out is 117 degrees, and we felt like it was of God to come and, <laughs> and, and be here with you. I bring you greetings from my, my wife, um, three kids. Uh, we're interracially uh, married, and so I'm a chocolate man. She's a vanilla woman. Our children are caramel. And uh, it's good to see in my home a window of the coming heaven, and it's good to see here at Wheaton a window of the coming heaven. Uh, they've given me 20 minutes to preach, which to the black preacher from Mississippi uh, is what we tend to call cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> But we'll do with it with what we can. Uh, you've heard the reading of scripture from Professor Ford. Let me ask Christ's blessing over our time together. Jesus, uh, make your name famous today, every day, and all this week. We ask it in your name. Every heart said, amen. Uh, then out of the ashes, there arose something beautiful in its place. Uh, on the 4th of August, 2020, uh, there in the city of Beirut, Lebanon, a violent explosion occurred. Uh, historians are now agreed that what was a vast and uh, massive underground storage of something called ammonium nitrate uh, to the tune of five and a half million pounds, suddenly it erupted and it rocked the city of Beirut and it rocked the surrounding world that was already reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic to its very core. And perhaps you remember as the videos of that ensuing carnage came in and you and I, uh, we lamented alongside the Lebanese the loss of 204 people, uh, 6,500 injuries, 300,000 people uh, left without a home. And believe it or not, that explosion now remains as the most violent non-nuclear explosion in human history. Uh, but then out of the ashes, uh, something beautiful arose uh, in its place. Everybody rushed in to help, Red Cross helped, Salvation Army helped, Europe helped, UN helped. Uh, but a lesser known story is a young sculptor, an artist by the name of Hayat Nazir who came in to help as well. Now all these institutions were coming in to try to remedy the ills of Beirut's recent past. It was her idea to spark hope for their future. And the story goes that she literally goes from house to house, from junkyard to junkyard, picking up pieces of trash, discarded glass and shards of metal and pottery and things that people didn't want. And over the course of several weeks, she puts it all together to erect this beautiful figurine in its place, sparking hope for her city's future. It was an artist who came along and in the midst of the ashes, she allowed something beautiful to emerge in its place. Now, I saw that to say, we just read a passage, and essentially what I want you to hear and think and feel is that that's the idea. The children of Israel in this passage are broken. They are hurting. They are, they are reeling from what they've gone through. But the good news of the gospel for them is that there's another sculptor on the scene who goes by the name of Jehovah, and he takes things that have been thrown away and are good for nothing, and through his own, th own articulation and artistry, he pieces those things together for a brand new start. I've got 16 minutes and 54 seconds left. <laughs> but with what, what I do, want to do with that time is remind you that even if you're broken today, there's a gospel message, there's a gospel deliverer named Jesus who can take the broken fragments of your life and put it back together again. It's a famous passage, and I want to lift up these three ideas, table of contents for our time. There is brokenness here. Nothing is too broken for God, and give that brokenness to God. I want to tag this text, Becoming Whole. What I learned in the pandemic so far is this, if I can find a way to get honest, I can find a way to get free. If I can find a way to get honest, I can find a way to get free. You're not talking to a person who has it put together. You're talking to a person who amidst the pandemic 
wrote two letters of resignation ready to deliver them to my elder board because I could no longer take the weight of a ministry and a congregation who was choosing to battle, not about the good news of the gospel and how we get it out, but whether or not we should wear masks or not, and whether or not we should vaccinate or not, and whether or not we should protest on this side or not. And the embroiled landscape that was pastoral ministry this year left me with anxiety attacks, left me with depression, left me with feeling that I was a failure. And you're talking to someone who was, in so many ways, still is broken. But it is in that that I learned that, wow, I don't have to be strong. I don't have to have it figured out. I don't have to have all the ideas. I simply need to be in the relationship with someone else who does have it figured out, who does have the ideas, who does have the posture and composition to lead our church through. And I've come to bear witness that the God who helped me in my brokenness is the God who'll help you today, but there is a requirement. Here it is. You got to be honest. It makes no sense to go to a foot doctor and tell him your elbow is hurting. The whole idea is that there's something about you and I letting go of the brokenness that's on the inside and bearing witness that it's real on the outside, that the Holy Spirit is free to do the surgery on our hearts and souls that he requires to do. So I think the first idea jumping out of the page here is this idea that there is brokenness here. There is brokenness here. Now our passage is one that a scholar said that what was a personal experience uh, for profit it grew into a parable and ultimately became prophecy. It was a personal experience for a prophet. It grows into a parable and it ultimately becomes prophecy. It's, of course, the famous story, right? Israel is just kind of embossed in sin and debauchery, political upheaval, wickedness and chaos. And in the midst of all that junk, God sends his prophet down to the potter's house. You know the story here. The potter is working at his wheel, but the clay he's working with is marred. And of course, the crux of the story is this, there's messed up pottery, messed up clay, but the potter doesn't throw it out. Instead, he keeps it on the wheel and he works with it to shape it and form it into something that seemed good for him to do. And in so being, it becomes this metaphor for Israel. Israel, you are jacked up from the flow up. But the good news of the gospel is that God's never going to throw you away. He's going to work with you and make you into what he wants you to be. And that good news for us today who feel broken? that God is not going to turn his back on us and throw us away, but he's going to keep us on the wheel called the cross of Calvary and allow that grace to minister to our hearts and make us into what he wants us to be. But you got to be honest. And so when you come to the text, that's the first revelation that there is brokenness here. Now for Israel, it was debauchery. It was wickedness. It was societal and political upheaval. Sound like anywhere else, you know, these days, it was all these things that was their brokenness, but your brokenness may be what seems to be the increasing disorientation of this moment. Even though you're surrounded by 2,500 students, the increasing sense that I am alone and lonely in the world, the pressure that this put on otherwise steady institutions around me, like the marriage of my parents, it doesn't seem as healthy as it was just a year and a half ago. The wherewithal of my finances does not seem as sure as it was just a year and a half ago. The foundation seems to be crumbling beneath us, and it may be crumbling beneath you. And part of the the, the way to deliverance is you being willing to say, this is broken. This is not going the way it was planned to go. This is not feeling the way it was supposed to feel. Now, I don't want to make a point here other than this. If you hear nothing else in this sermon, hear this. A country boy from Pearl, Mississippi came to you in September 2021 to say, I've been there. I've done that. I've got the t-shirt. There is hope on the other side of this brokenness. Don't you dare give up. After the rain, it really does. There's a rainbow. After the war, there really will be peace. After after the brokenness, you really can be made whole again. What's happening today doesn't define your tomorrow. Ricky, how can you so emphatically assure us of these truths? Because the text teaches me, sorry if I get black preacher for like two minutes, then I promise I'll come back to wherever it is you are. But hear this good news. 
The text teaches us that there is nothing too broken for God. I don't care the sin struggle you're suffering with. I don't care the weight of the tumult in your life. The good news of the gospel is that if he can part Red Seas and crumble Jericho's walls, he can help you. Nothing is too broken for God. We read verse 4 and look at it real quickly. It basically says he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed too good or good for the potter to do. And now I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I do know enough to know that in the original language, it is somewhat of a subjunctival expression, subjunctival. In other words, uh, when we translate it woodenly, what he's saying about what's going on with the clay is this. It's saying that whenever the clay would break, the potter would rework it into another vessel. You didn't get it. I'll say it again. Whenever the clay would fall apart, the potter's response to that brokenness was just to fix it over. In other words, it's not a one-shot willy moment. It's not just one piece of clay that had one chance to be made over again. No, the, the, the thrust of the language is this. Whenever something happened to the clay, the potter would stay with the clay and rework it into a, another vessel. And the whole idea is this, there is nothing too broken for God. I think we learn two things about the good news of bad news of our broken seasons. Here's the first. Obviously, God doesn't throw the broken thing away. The Bible says it was spoiled. It was marred. It's a strong language there. It basically means good for nothing, totally ruined. But God doesn't throw it away. What's the lesson? When you fail, God doesn't give up on you. When it's hard, God doesn't leave you. When it's hopeless, God still has hope that he has enough to turn your situation around when you put your trust and faith in Jesus. I know, I don't know about you, but that was good news for me in a pandemic that when I felt like a failure, God didn't move on to a bigger and better pastor to do my job. When I felt like a failure, God didn't move on to a bigger and better husband for me to love April. He didn't move on to a bigger and better dad to father my kids. No, he decided that you're the Ricky I'm going to be committed to. I'm going to stick in it with you and make sure we finish this thing to the end. And I hear Paul in Philippians 1, 6 saying that he who has begun a good work in you is able to finish it and complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. And some of you are saying, but Ricky, I've got a past. And Ricky, I've got a long resume of failure and brokenness in my life. And I don't know how God can make good out of all of this bad in my life. Now I've got to do something very risky and take you to an illustration that comes from 1985. I'm embarrassed to even admit that I can remember that year, but can I get a Back to the Future movie witness out there? I just need two or three gathered together in his name. Back to the Future, you know the story, Marty McFly, Doc Brown, they get into DeLorean, a time machine, it needs plutonium, they go back in time, they have their wild adventures. And Marty McFly at the end of the movie is about to sail off into the sunset. They've got it figured out and they're home. But then Doc Brown appears out of nowhere in the DeLorean. And he shows up and he says, here's a Doc Brown impersonation that's going to bomb, but I'm going to do it anyway. Marty! Okay, all right, good, that worked. Anyways, but, but he comes out out of nowhere and he says, Marty, we've got to go back to the future and we've got to help your kids. And, and Marty looks at him and says, Doc, we can't go back to the future. We don't have any plutonium. But some of you remember how Doc says it's not a problem anymore. And he lifts up the hood of the DeLorean and it exposes something called a Mr. Fusion machine. Remember this? And, and Doc literally goes to the trash can and he gets like banana peels and he gets beer cans with beer left over. I'm sure it was not alcoholic. And he gets uh, egg cartons and all this kind of stuff. And he puts it down the Mr. Fusion machine. And apparently there was something about the Mr. Fusion machine that knew how to create fuel out of failure and knew how to make trash into something that could be used to get them back to the future. If you get it sooner, I'll preach much shorter, but, but God told me to tell you that when it comes to your failure and it comes to the trash of your life, the cross of Jesus Christ is heaven's Mr. Fusion machine. And he knows how to take your trash and take your past and take your failure and use it as fuel to get you back to the future he desires for you to live. So that's the first thing we learn. He doesn't throw the broken thing away. The second thing we learn is this. He just reworks it. 
God is brilliant at starting over. I'm here today because I'm a witness that he's good at starting over. My Bible says he just reworked it. It's the Hebrew word sha'as. First time we see that word in Scripture was is with Adam and Eve had sinned against God. But you remember the story. Does God turn his back on Adam and Eve? No. He turns his face towards them. He allows an animal to be slain so that they may be sha'ast with skins. And what was this a premonition of? This was a forecast of another lamb who would be slain and allow a covering for you when you put your trust and faith in Jesus. So the good news for broken people today is that the grace of God is still at work. If there's breath in your body, there is grace for your soul. He is still in the Sha'as business, and he knows how to rework it into something brand new. But you got to admit that there's brokenness here. And you got to believe that nothing is too broken for God. And so, Ricky, then what is the last step of this process of wholeness and healing and purpose and peace that God wants to do in me? Ricky, what's one more step? Here it is. Give God your brokenness. Wheaton College, I dare you this week to put the broken clay of your life to the hands of the potter. Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say this three times because Dr. Riken has written an entire commentary on Jeremiah, which is no pressure for me at all. <laughs> but in case you missed it, this is the idea of Jeremiah 18. God is the one who shapes, but we are the ones who must submit. God is the one who shapes, we are the ones who Submit. I've got three children, Camden, Grand, and Andy. Uh, Seven-year-old boy, four-year-old boy, two-year-old girl who is perfect in all her ways. <laughs> and uh, my children uh, are amazing. They love Play-Doh. They love Play-Doh. Like, you come to my house, it'll be Play-Doh everywhere. Now, when I was coming up, it was just red, green, yellow, blue. Now they got every color of the rainbow. My children have mauve. <laughs> Hope, <laughs> periwinkle, blue, it's crazy. And there's just, there's just, now, uh, when I was coming up, all you could make with, with Play-Doh was a ball and a stick. <laughs> My children can make spaghetti, rigatoni, penne, they, you know, they got every pasta in Italy, they can make it all. Um, they can make all kinds of structures, churches and fire departments, and they can make every animal, lions, tigers, bears, you say. They can make it all. Now, they've fallen in love with this show called Peppa Pig. So what's interesting about my, my, my children is that they now speak in, in British accents. So, so they'll be making this Play-Doh, and they call themselves master artists now. And they'll, they'll make their little figure, and they'll come to me, and they'll say, Father, come and see the masterpiece that I've created for you. Is it not beautiful? And I'm like, like, who's letting you watch Netflix at night? Like, what's going on? And so there's all, they're always making stuff. So there'll be lions and tigers, and Father, come and check out this wonderful masterpiece I've made. And so they're just talking crazy. And what's interesting, in the years that I've watched them make masterpieces out of the Play-Doh, not one time did they, as master artists, ask the Play-Doh what the Play-Doh wants to be made into. Not, not one time did they say, Play-Doh, <laughs> adorned with your periwinkle blue, what would be your best estimation as to what I should make you into? No. Seven-year-olds seem to understand that whatever's best for this Play-Doh, that idea is in me. And so all I need is this clay to submit to my plan. If you get it sooner, I'll preach my shorter <laughs> in my life. It seems to be, if I can use sanctified imagination, it seems to be that the clay understands that last time I made decisions, I fell apart. 
Last time I did it my way, I ended up in the potter's hands broken. That last time I wanted to do it the way I wanted to do it, all I did was simply lose it all, and now I'm marred in his hands. And I think in my sanctified imagination that Clay this time is excited that the potter doesn't throw broken things away, but makes us into something brand new. But understand, this year, let the Lord Christ be the one who shapes, and you enjoy a life of fulfillment and peace knowing that your gift to that process is to be the one who submits. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. We pray this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen? amen. And amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Have a great day, everybody.